River Musky Factory. Thanks to Slide and the Drift for rocking us into week 10 of the Musky Monday seminar series. What a week we have for you this week. Um, the most influential man in the musky world in the last 25 years, Jim Sarek, is our guest tonight. Uh, Jim's been the teacher to a couple generations of musky anglers. Nobody's taught more people more about muskies than Jim has. Um, he started in 1993 um, with his involvement in Musky Hunter magazine, loved it so much he bought it and made it essential reading for all of us. The key learning tool of the 90s uh, for musky anglers everywhere. Moved on with Musky Hunter Television, 15 years of Musky Hunter Television, um, the best video that's ever been shot, the best learning that's ever been done on video week after week for 15 seasons. Um, he's the most traveled guy in the musky world. He's the most in-demand speaker at all the trade shows uh, for the last 20 years, and we have him here tonight. So get your questions ready, send them in. Uh, we're gonna take a lot of questions for Jim this evening. And as usual, we have Dr. Sean Landsman with us tonight on the Ask the Biologist segment. This week, Sean is gonna be talking about musky diets. What do your muskies eat? And more importantly, those things that the muskies eat, what do they do? Where do they hang out? And knowing that's going to help us catch more muskies. So ask the biologist coming up shortly. We'll get our thank yous out of the way first. And say, as always, thank you to you, the listener, for uh, shaping this show. Your feedback, your questions, your comments, your questions for, for Sean, your in-house questions every week. Tell us what you want to hear what you want to learn. We'll find those people and uh, we'll learn more about it together. Uh, thanks to our Muskie Factory Bates and Ottawa River Muskie Factory team. Mike Spratt, who's somewhere behind the scenes in the basement, madly uh, prepping for the upcoming Odyssey and the Muskie Symposium. Uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa Goodyear, our producer extraordinaire, our guide extraordinaire, and our leader builder extraordinaire. Uh, Lisa, come on out. You've got some leader news. How are you doing? Yeah, no, frantically uh, building leaders this week, and we have some some cool news on an, on a couple of upgrades to the leaders this year. So as you know, we use Seaguar 150 pound fluorocarbon, but we've actually upgraded now to Seaguar Premier, which is uh, the same diameter that we're currently using, but we actually get an extra 20 pounds of strength. So our leaders are now rated at 170. Uh, for, for casting and for trolling and we're at 180. But the other really cool piece of equipment we now have is an industrial crimper. So um, the neat thing about the industrial crimper is actually specifically designed to, uh, to just slightly offset the crimp. So for instance, if you're looking at um, hand crimpers, which, are, which work great if you're making your own leaders, you can't really see that, but it's a perfectly round crimp. So the offset crimp gives you the ultimate strength. So really looking forward to, to using that. Um, and while we're here, I have a few, uh, actually a quick tip for those that are making their own leaders. So, and I'm going to just throw up a picture here real quick. So on the left here with the green arrow, this is a really good crimp. You'll notice there's actually a little bit of a flare at the top and the bottom. The crimp is more in the middle. That is what you want in a crimp. That's going to give you your strength. If you crimp like on the right here, you're going to get a pinch point right at the top here and it can actually cause a weak spot or a place where your leader could fail. So something to keep in mind if you are uh, crimping your own leaders. All right, thanks a lot. Lots of people making their own equipment these days. Good tip to start. Um, thanks to Mike Kadura, who's in the background as usual, answering questions. Um, one or 200 a week as they come in. Hey Mike, thanks for being hey, here John. as always. Hey, good to see you, man. I'm excited. I mean, I'm looking for my pom-poms here. I'm like, oh, I, did, I got started fishing back watching Jim Sarek on Musky Hunter Television. I was so excited. To, you know, I watched him one winter, and I thought, I'm going to try that. I'm going to buy a musky rod, and I bought one blade bait, and, man, did I have a blast. It changed my whole world. So I'm just tickled. I'm getting goosebumps. I can't wait to see Jim tonight on the show. It's really an honor, and... What a, what a great, great thing this is, watching this every Monday night. So I'll be answering your questions. Thanks, as always, Mike. And, yeah, um, Jim got so many people started in Muskie 
And like I said, he's been a generational teacher. We'll get to Jim in just a moment or two. Thanks to Shimano. Um, been a big part of Jim's life, been a big part of my life all along. 100 years old. Thanks to Andre Lalone, Crestliner Boats and Mercury Motors. Thanks to Suic. Thanks to Chaos Tackle. Thanks to Sale, Canada's Outdoor Superstore. And thanks to Muskies Canada, April 17th and 18th, the online odyssey, uh, the greatest learning experience online, all in one place, the greatest event um, all in one place in North America this year, April 17th and 18th. You don't want to miss that. Jim Sarek is going to be speaking at that as well with Gord Pizer, and they're going to be talking about Northern Ontario waters, um, Lake of the Woods, the Great Lakes of the North. Um, and what's going on up there these days. So uh, a, a great chance for all of us to learn coming up. I uh, want to throw a shout out to the Muskie Symposium uh, through Muskie Trader. That's happening to raise funds for research. That's April uh, April 30th and May 1st. Sean Landsman's going to be at that event as well, talking project Noble Beast, Dr. Stephen Cook. Um, and there's going to be a whole bunch of money raised directly for research at that event. Got to throw a shout out to the Hamilton chapter of Muskies Canada. Their meeting is tomorrow night. Um, it's not an online broadcast event, an in-house event. Um, one of the reasons you belong to Muskies is Canada for meetings like the one tomorrow night. Uh, Davin Heinbach is the guest and he's, he's the guy who's kept the logs for Muskies Canada for 15 years. So um, they're going to take apart the logs learn from the numbers, learn statistically what works and what doesn't. Um, an incredible opportunity to learn at the Hamilton chapter tomorrow. And Wednesday night, the Upper Ottawa Valley chapter is having Billy Craig, Muskie legend Billy Craig, another event uh, you really want to attend. Um, and let's move on to Dr. Sean Landsman and our Ask the Biologist segment talking about Muskie diet. Um, Hey, Sean. Hey, John. How's it going? Fantastic as usual. You're smiling as usual. Good to see you. Musky diets. What yeah. Muskies eat, what muskies like to eat. Yeah, yeah. And just uh, I'll, I'll piggyback off of what Mike said earlier that that Jim and Mu the Musky Hunter magazine and Musky Hunter TV really, I don't even know if I'd be here right now talking to everybody if it weren't for Jim and Musky Hunter magazine, and I was just uh, looking around for my copy of the Complete Guide to Musky Hunting, which is a book by Jim and Steve Hiding. And I that thing is I, I don't know if it's in my in my house right now or maybe with my parents, but that thing was dog-eared like crazy. I must have memorized every word in that book. Uh, so anyway, I uh, I'm pretty stoked to be here on the same program as Jim. So it's pretty cool. But um, we'll go ahead and uh, and share my screen now. Let me pull this up. So yeah, we're gonna be uh, we'll be talking about uh, musky diets, and I mean this is a huge topic, right? This could be this could be the the basis of a one or two hour presentation. I do not want to take up that much time because we got the uh, the legendary Jim Sarek on the program today. So I'm gonna go over some um, some I think are kind of key information about some of the more common bait fish species, um, prey species. And we'll take a look at some like weird oddballs too, and, and maybe some things that uh, might help inform bait selection and and, uh, and and where you might go to, to chase these fish. So let's, uh, let's get right in it. Um, so, so, you know, what do muskies eat, right? Well, I mean, I'm talking to a bunch of musky nuts here. Uh, so, I think everyone kind of knows that muskies are opportunists. They eat just about anything. Um, you know, there's that there's a painting right there of a muskie jumping out of the water to grab a red winged blackbird hanging off a cattail. And there's been various renditions of that. Um, you know, I, I've heard stories of of old timers back in like the early 1900s that would put a chipmunk on a board and then pull a chipmunk off and the muskie would come up and grab the chipmunk that's trying to swim to shore, which is a little bit macabre. <laughs> uh, this day and age, maybe not so cool to do, but, you know, the fact is they are a pretty generalist uh, predator. Um, they do primarily eat perch and suckers. Um, and minnows when they're uh, when they're younger, um, when the muskies are younger, they tend to, to forage on, on little minnows. Um, of course, this is going to vary depending on 
the body of water. And we'll get into that. So my home state of Illinois, um, we didn't don't have a ton of, of perch. Um, and probably the main forage base in Illinois would be gizzard shad. And we'll talk a little bit about gizzard shad. <clears throat> so one of my favorite studies to come out in the last few years relative to muskies uh, was this particular diet related study, um, which effectively looked at uh, prey size among a bunch of different uh, a, a bunch of different fish species in the Midwest, including predators like muskies. Um, and basically, you know, they kind of pose the question, should we go big or, or go home? And um, their data seemed to indicate what we kind of see on, on, the, on the screen here. Um, if you just ignore all the little data points there, just take a look at the way the lines are moving, they're going up. And so what that's telling us is that as a predator gets bigger, as a muskie gets bigger, in this case, um, prey total length, so the, the size of prey also increases. Um, so in other words, that the, the, the bigger a muskie is, the bigger its prey tends to be. But what if you look closely at that graph, one of the other things it shows you is that even at relatively large sizes, and a thousand millimeter fish is about 40 inches, so we're not talking like a double nickel fish here, but even at a relatively larger sized fish, see these, these little points down towards the bottom here? That's coinciding with prey that's pretty small. So the story here is that, yes, big fish tend to eat bigger prey, but they will also eat smaller prey too. They will always eat small play, prey. It's not like they're just going out and selecting the biggest prey species uh, and individuals to consume. And it also doesn't matter whether the fish is shaped uh, one particular way or not, like it's a sucker or a perch versus a shad or a bluegill, which tend to be taller uh, in, in body, they have um, more body depth to them. It doesn't really matter regardless of shape, this pattern seems to hold. Okay, so some common musky foods. So in Canada and uh, like Ontario uh, and uh, the upper Midwest, we tend to see fish feeding on suckers, yellow perch, uh, panfish, particularly bluegills, uh, and ciscos where they may be present. In the Midwest or South um, Eastern United States, including St. Clair, we start to see uh, the incorporation of more gizzard shad into their diets and things like suckers and, and panfish as well. Again, each body of water is going to have its own kind of unique forage basis. So St. Clair, we, we also see white perch being consumed pretty readily. Uh, and even moon eye too, to some degree, but primarily we're seeing get gizzard shad consumed in a lot of those lakes. So ciscos, uh, also known as tulabies, um, these are a species of, of, of herring uh, that spawn on, on reefs uh, in the fall, or actually it's a species of, of whitefish. Um, and they spawn on reefs in the fall. They are a cold water fish, so uh, they tend to prefer temperatures less than about 58 Fahrenheit. Um, they tend to be found in lakes. Um, so lakes with bigger muskies tend to also have ciscos. And this is based on some work um, by Vanderblumen uh, in, in 2020. And um, they also found that larger muskies tend to be associated with smaller sized ciscos. So in other words, what, what this means is, is probably what's going on here is that bigger muskies um, just even though they get bigger, they still may have a hard time handling a bigger sized uh, cisco. So the, even the lakes with big, with big muskies tend to have smaller sized ciscos. And so there may just be something going on there with the size of their mouths. Um, white suckers to me are a really interesting fish. Um, they are, uh, they, they kind of function in, in, especially in the Great Lakes, much like, like salmon do on the West Coast, except they don't die when they come in and spawn, but they carry in tons of nutrients from open, open lake environments into the tributaries that they go and spawn in. So they're a spring spawner in creeks and tributaries. They're abundant in many lakes. Uh, again, they're a primary food of muskies and they can get pretty big. Maximum length is around, uh, around 20 inches. Um, they may have limited movement except to spawn. They've been known to travel pretty far distances uh, to go into tributaries and creeks. 
Um, when they get into larger lake environments, like in the Great Lakes, they may be moving around a bit more, um, but uh, they, they, for the most part, their home ranges tend to be pretty small, both in, in summer and winter. Um, they're a species that feeds fully on the bottom. You can see, you know, just, you know that just the way their mouth is positioned on their bodies, uh, kind of positioned just underneath. They'll eat anything from like insects and bugs to, uh, to detritus. And so that'd be like debris on the bottom, plant material and things like that. Uh, I don't think anyone really needs any introduction to yellow perch. They're a primary food of, of muskies. Uh, they're spring spawner. They tend to produce what, what are called, they do produce things that are called skeins, that are kind of um, like a gelatinous mixture uh, of eggs and, and gelatin that kind of holds it all together. Um, something that's kind of interesting about, about yellow perch as it relates to some of my own research is that um, we know that perch tend to have pretty predictable and cyclic patterns of activity. So their patterns of activity tend to mirror what I found in muskies locally here around Ottawa um, in that they're most active at dusk, but least active at dawn. But they kind of increase in activity as from dawn through day, peaking at dusk and then tapering off at night. And we see the same pattern in muskies. And so um, that may be why we we at least saw some of that uh, some of those activity patterns in muskies um, in simple lakes. So these are lakes without a lot of structural complexity. They may go deeper uh, during the summer as opposed to uh, more complex lakes um, that have a lot of of habitat and cover. Um, they may not have to necessarily go as deep in summer to access some of those environments. They tend to like vegetation. Again, if you know anything about perch, they tend to hang out around, especially smaller ones, tend to hang out around uh, vegetation. But, you know, there have been studies that have looked at their movements and, and the substrate in locations where they're found. And it could be silt, it could be mud. You know, soft bottom uh, habitats will also have a lot of uh, insect larvae down in the substrate that will eventually emerge. Um, and as they emerge, um, the, the perch can come in and, and eat them as, as those bugs emerge and eventually get to the surface and then go on as adults. Um, bluegills, um, I, I could probably talk about bluegills for an hour. I think they're super cool. Uh, they have really interesting reproductive strategies. Um, they are a spring spawner. They tend to form colonies and defend nests. So when they form these colonies in the spring, they're like really faithful to their nests uh, and they will try and chase off even a, a six foot, 200 pound guy swimming around in the water, uh, poking his head into their nest. They'll come right up to your mask or whatever. They'll bite your fingers. I've had them bite my beard, uh, my eyebrows before. Uh, it's, they're pretty, they're pretty, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty cheeky. Um, they, uh, as such, because in the, especially in the spring, this would be like maybe June around here in Ontario, but that's going to vary depending on latitude. They're pretty vulnerable. I've seen bass go right into their nests and just pick off individuals um, that, uh, that are too busy trying to defend their nests. So if you can find some colonies of, of bluegills uh, in lakes where there's muskies, there very well may be muskies nearby um, and lakes or rivers. Um, they primarily associate with cover um, where they're eating a lot of insects, but you can also find them in open water um, where they'd be targeting more zooplankton out in, in the open water environments. Uh, gizzard shad are a spring spawner. So these are, uh, these are a type of herring, um, one of our freshwater herring. Uh, they're an open water filter feeder. Um, they tend to come shallow during fall. Anyone that has ever uh, fished Lake St. Clair I need not say much else about those those fall shad migrations, especially coming up towards the the, the Thames River. There, um, that photo on the bottom right there uh, is from an article that that appeared last fall when there was a big migration of them. Um, but they're basically coming in out of those open lake environments towards the tributaries and creeks in the fall to uh, to, to follow the food sources um, and and plankton in particular. They're like I said, they're a, they're a filter feeder, so they're just going to move around. Uh, to where the the food the food go. Uh, bullheads are another uh, another prey of of muskies. Um, 
I, I looked for a report on the O'Brien fish, but uh, purportedly it had a lot of, uh, of bullheads in its belly. Um, it was pretty chock full of them. Um, in North America, we have uh, yellow, brown, and black pr primarily. Um, uh, black bullheads, are, you don't find them as far east uh, in, in North America as, as you would the yellow and brown bullheads. But these are spring spawners, so they will also build nests in, in June and July. Um, that actually, that one there in the bottom right there, that was photographed in a lake here in Ontario. If you look really closely, that's a nest in the background. It actually dug a hole into the into the lake bottom, and those little black dots in the nest itself are its its babies. And it was very, uh, it did not take kindly to me uh, being being around trying to take its picture. So I eventually left because uh, it seemed like it was getting pretty stressed out. But they would be another uh, uh, food source for muskies. Now here locally on the Ottawa River, emerald shiners are um, a well-known uh, food source, or at least a well-known fish that muskies tend to relate to. Um, presumably they're there to feed on them. They may be feeding on other things that are feeding in turn on the emerald shiners. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're in the know around the Ottawa area, you know if you can find those emerald shiners, uh, especially during the fall, your chances are, are, are pretty good. That you're going to find the muskies not too far away. But emerald shiners are one of the most common minnow species uh, across North America. Um, they are, a, minnows in general are a staple for smaller muskies, um, but as well as bigger ones. Remember back to what I mentioned earlier, but even big fish will eat small ones. Um, emerald shiners will spawn at night during spring and summer, late spring and summer. Um, so they'll come right up to the surface and they broadcast their eggs into the water column and then those eggs just float around or they get carried around in the currents. Um, like gizzard shad, um, they are also filter feeders. So they're also um, uh, maybe not so much filter feeding, but they're, they're actively looking for zooplankton. So um, they're a plankton feeder. Um, I wanted to throw up uh, some, this is a weird one, Saint, the St. John River. We had Marlon Prince talk uh, to, uh, to us earlier this year um, on the program. Um, that body of water is particularly intriguing because those muskies out there get really fat for their length. So that was a, only a 39 incher there, but that, that fish had a 19 inch girth on it. It was a pretty chunky fish. Um, they have done some diet, they've done a diet study out there um, where they pumped the stomachs of muskies looking for salmon smolts to see if they were actually eating any salmon smolts in that uh, salmon famous river. And they didn't find any salmon smolts. What they found instead were river herring, uh, which out in that region is called Gasparo uh, and American shad. So that bottom right photo there, that's an American shad. It's a nine, over 19 inch, about a 19 and and a quarter inch uh, American shad. So herring, uh, river herring and American shad are super high energy source. Um, and so that's maybe why we're seeing such uh, well-conditioned fish out in that body of water. Some other oddballs here, the Kentucky state record apparently had a 27 inch carp in its stomach. Um, there's the top right there. That's a picture of the Kentucky state record. Uh, there is one of the more cited musky diet studies. Um, by Bozek et al. in 1999, they list mice as uh, one of the prey sources that they are uh, prey species that they found within uh, musky stomachs. And so there's a, a little picture there of a flat tail and a chipmunk pattern. Uh, so pretty, like I mentioned earlier, chipmunks may have been used by some of the forefathers of, of musky fishing. And I just want to make a kind of final word here before I turn it over to, to Jim, because I know you guys are all dying to hear him talk. But um, I, it's hard to talk about musky diets without sort of mentioning the fact that muskies are going to primarily be targeting the fish species, the prey species that are in most abundance. Of course, they're an opportunist. If you give me a Big Mac, I'm probably not going to turn my head away from it. Um, I'm probably going to grab that Big Mac and eat it. And so if there's like an injured sport fish species swimming around or you know, fish, a muskie just happens to be pretty hungry and a, you know, a, a nice sized bass swims by, um, they will probably strike at it and they'll probably eat it, but they do not consume a disproportionate amount of their, uh, a, a disproportionate amount of their food is not, can, does not consist of sport fish like walleye and, and bass. And this isn't for lack of looking, this is just what 
what researchers find. There's really no empirical evidence to suggest that they are destroying walleye populations or other uh, other game fish species, including smallmouth bass. And they've looked, again, there was just looking at a study earlier tonight about smallmouth bass in the New River in Virginia. Um, and they had, people had some concerns about muskies uh, hurting those population, that population of, of smallies. And they really didn't find much evidence that, that they were consumed. They found some be being consumed, but not enough to put a dent in the population. So um, definitely want to just touch on that. And uh, yeah, as, as always, if you've got any more questions for me, you can reach out uh, landsman.sean at gmail.com or send a message to, uh, to John and uh, he'll get those questions to me. Fantastic as always, Sean. And I'll just say the last stomach census that I'm aware of that was done around Ottawa, I think goes back into the 90s, was collecting fish that were brought into taxidermists and number one fish in the belly, bullheads, brown bullheads, you know, bigger fish, spending more time on the bottom, but um, that's what they're eating. And that's what we have most of in the river, it seems, you know, even today. Yeah. Uh, Ottawa River, the highest, the species with the highest biomass now, I believe, is uh, ch uh, channel catfish. It used to be American eel, um, but now it seems completely different assemblage, primarily consisting of, of channel catfish, at least by biomass. So, yeah. Yeah, it was American eel. And then the dam, putting yeah. the dams in the river stopped the American eel from running. And it's, uh, it's, big it's on, the, on the brink of extinction, except for the good work from the Riverkeeper people. Uh, working hard to keep that species alive. That's a topic for a show later on. Thanks for taking us to school again this week, Sean. Fantastic as always. You're welcome, much, John. Much appreciated. And the man of the hour, I guess, Jim, if you're in the background, you can see we've carefully assembled the Jim Sarek fan club here this evening, um, up and down. Everybody loves Jim and there's a good reason for that. Um, like I said, the most influential guy in the musky world for the, the last 25 years, um, I called this show the Musky Ambassador. There is no Musky Ambassador, but if there was somebody who was going to represent our sport um, and be in the in the forefront, um, saying the right things, doing the right things, teaching the right le uh, lessons, um, representing us with decorum and intelligence, and being an advocate for for the fish as well as the fishermen, it's Jim Sarek. All of those things. Um, he's hugely successful. He's hugely in demand for for a, a lot of good reasons. Um, I've filmed, I don't know, 25 or 26 different shows, episodes, maybe 15 or 16 different shows. Jim is the most organized guy I've ever had show up. Um, he showed up with 12 talking points and he knew when he wanted to introduce them. And they were always right after we release a big fish, which is, yeah, okay, great. Super. It's got 12 talking points and no pressure there. But, you know, he is he is just prepared um, from end to end. And that's why he's achieved what he has and why he's the teacher that he is. I said earlier, he's the most traveled guy in the in the musky world um, everywhere that you can think of. And that comes from from doing the TV show in different locations every week. Um, and from going and fishing, just for having a thirst for going and fishing everywhere. So one of our themes that we're going to start out with tonight is regional knowledge and uh, what's Jimmy learned in different places, how are fish different in different places. And um, the first time I ran into Jim on the Ottawa River was in, I think, 1995. He was just out fishing. Didn't tell anybody he was here. Nobody knew that he was here. But we ran into him and a, a group of 10 or 12 Muskies Canada guys all flocked to a diner in Rockland to sit down and have dinner with Jim, who very uh, openly and easily sat and educated us about our river for, for a good couple of hours. And uh, um, wow, tonight we have him here. That's going back to nine later, 26 years later. Here we are. Um, I used to use one of Jim's quotes when I was talking in the States in the nineties, he called this the last bastion of pure musky fishing left in the world. If you're from Ottawa, Eastern Ontario, a lot of times you don't realize how good you have it until you start traveling and looking elsewhere. That's, that's quite a quote. Um, I'll see if Jim still thinks that today. So let's bring Jim out after saying all of those nice things. 
I don't know what to think about all this. I mean, you're just like a little over the top there, John, for sure. You know, I'm trying to get this little light adjusted. So if I, my face is dark and light, I'm trying to make it so it's a little dark in this room. So it would have been just the right amount of fluff, but I didn't know Sean was going to go off too and Mike as well. And <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. You're that guy. You're that guy. So thanks. Thanks so much for being here. Um, a man who's more traveled than anybody else in the musky world. True. Well, I'm about that. I mean, I, I mean, I definitely like to kind of go do new things. You know, I, I mean, I'd say if there's one thing that I've always enjoyed about musky fishing, it's it's going fishing new lakes, trying to fish at different times and, and do that as opposed to fishing the same thing. I mean, yes, I grew up fishing northern Wisconsin and had a, had a home. My family had a home there and I did the same thing. But, you know, I kind of get bored doing the same thing. You know, you kind of master it. You figure out what's going on. You move on. And, and that's what I was in. And I've always been in the search for, you know, newer bites, you know, areas where there aren't as much fishing pressure and uh, growing up in areas with lots of fishing pressure. I can tell all of you that live in Ontario and musky fish that I don't care what, what fishing pressure you think you have, you have none. You know what I mean? It just doesn't exist in Ontario, you know, and uh, I know you think there's some, but truly it's really nothing that we deal with in most of the waters we fish in the states you know but i know i just love fishing lots of different lakes and going to new things because that kind of challenges me you know and uh and trying to find fish on a new body of water either a high population a low population it doesn't matter it's kind of that challenge on finding where they're at and and then what's it take to get them to bite yeah it's that puzzle wherever you go we're always trying to solve yeah. solve that puzzle just with different parameters and so do you know off off the top how many states have muskies in them? Um, I believe it's 36 states of the 50, which is way more than you think. Now, that doesn't mean there's got lots of, you know, lots of lakes in them. Some, some of those states have, you know, one lake with some fish in them, but it may not be the most fishable population. But it's amazing how there's lakes like the state of New Mexico in southwestern u.s has a lake called blue water lake that has more muskies per acre than any other lake in all of north america which is i've never been there actually i take that back i've been i drove by the boat launch and stopped there but uh, i've never fished it you know from there but it's crazy that a lake in new mexico has you know you know somewhere in the order of like 15 to 20 fish per acre yeah um it is in 36 states how many of those states uh are are new to new to the musky world places where muskies have just been brought in like new mexico washington state oregon i know are on those lists yeah it's hard it's hard you know when you say new what's crazy is that it really was about 25 years ago and you know where a lot of late a lot of states throughout the US they started stocking muskies and it, and it could have been 30 years ago with some of them but there was that 25 to 30 year where, where a lot of states started putting fish in in um you know expanding the musky range you know kind of if you build it they will come and um and the and in many of the lakes in the, in the southern parts of the u.s or even the western parts of the u.s maybe you don't have you don't have adequate spawning grounds so they're kind of put and take fisheries right you stock them in there they're going to live and you know I, i'm sure sean would kind of be able to back me up on that that it's that's kind of the nature of those beasts you know they're developed for people to go musky fishing and just just for the sport you know and but if you stop stocking them they'll be gone you know in in some point in time and they'll go away you know so it's supported by musky zinc clubs and anglers and and then they just want to go but but many of these fisheries over the last 10 to 15 years even on that southern and western part of the musky range have turned into really outstanding fisheries i mean there's states like virginia right now as we speak you could go out and catch multiple muskies in a day in Virginia or North Carolina um, there, but certainly Virginia right now is really good. I'm seeing photos every day from a couple of friends of mine in Virginia that are just crushing them. And I'm just like, wow, everything's frozen by me, you know, and they are just tearing them up for the last month. You know? That sounds really attractive to Canadians because we don't have any opportunities this time of year. Um, and what's the, what are the other southern fisheries that Canadians can go to now? Like down, Tennessee, is that as far south in the center of the U.S.? 
Well, I mean, again, you know, the great thing is, you know, you could go and and you could fish if you want to, you know, you could go Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, you know, that whole thing, you know, you can fish Kentucky, obviously. Um, and, uh, you know, Missouri has them and that whole Southern boundary, all of that same latitude per se. And they all have, have really good fisheries that are there. But, you know, again, the, the thing is, since a lot of these fish, since the fish don't, they go through the spawning process and, and yes, they produce some young, but it's not a self-sustaining population. Um, you know, in many of these cases, these fish spawn and you have no natural reproduction ongoing in a lot of those lakes. And they're not trying to get that per se. It's just the habitat is such that they're not going to have it. So they just stock them to keep them going. And, uh, and, and so you can fish them all year round. So you could go to a state, you know, like Ohio um, and, and catch them, you know, early on. I mean, right now, I think some of those lakes are still probably frozen and just opening, but in the month of March, as a general rule, all of a sudden everything explodes March and April. And that I've got lots of friends of mine that they start musky fishing in usually around middle of March and they fish all of April. And then, you know, by by that June time frame when the, the quote unquote musky season opens in certain parts of the US, you know, you get to that mid to late June where it opens in, in Canada. A lot of guys have, you know, that I know have 50, 75, maybe even a hundred muskies under the belt by the time, you know, the third week of June rolls around, which is really crazy to think that happens. Yeah. One of my dream vacations as a Canadian, as weird as it sounds, is I want to go to Nashville early in the spring. I want to catch a hockey game. I want to hear some great music and I want to go musky fishing, you know, in a civilized, civilized temperature. And, you know, you can do that this time of year, right? March and yeah. April. Yes. That's big. Sure. Um, is a musky a musky a musky? Is it the same fish all over the U.S.? Or what are the what are the differences regionally about the fish itself? Like yeah. You have stocked fish, you have tigers, you know, and we have an all wild fishery, you know, up here. So yeah. our our stocked fish, you know, what what what's different? What's different about these to you? Do you approach them any differently? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. It's, it, you know, I, I will tell you that I believe that a muskie is a muskie is a muskie to some degree. However, every lake has idiosyncrasies about it and and that, you know, there may be certain lures or, or something or a way to approach fishing them that can be more productive. OK, and so um, I give an example. So the. The lakes in, in some of these southern reservoirs that are shad based, you know, the shad based lakes, you fish a shad based lake in early season when the water's cold. You know, say you're fishing for pre spawn or spawning or post spawn muskies. The shad based lakes, the muskies tend to be very active. I mean, they can chase down traditional musky lures and um, they're fast moving, you know, speed still is important. And, and so you can catch fish on normal baits, you know, almost from the get go. And I think it's because the shad, they swim fast, they move around and, and the muskies just follow them around and just kind of go with that where, you know, let's say you're fishing maybe the Ontario opener or you're fishing Northern Wisconsin or Northern Minnesota on the opener. And, you know, those fish have more than likely in many, depending on where you are throughout Ontario, may have just finished spawning, maybe a couple weeks off the spawn. And, and so then what happens is those fish, because you've got suckers and they're feeding, you know, they're feeding on suckers, maybe perch, um, you know, blue, you know, bullheads, et cetera. They tend to not be as active, you know, it seems like to me in my experience. And so I don't catch them on the traditional lures. I do better quite often on the opener fishing, you know, bass stuff, a husky jerk, you know, just truly fishing. I will go and, and I used to fish some tournaments really early in that first week or two of season, they'd always have a couple early in the States. And, you know, I did really well, just basically bass fishing for muskies. And that's typically if you, I'm sure many of you muskie fish in, the, in, in, in a lot of the Northern range early on, you run into bass anglers and they catch them on jigs, they catch them on soft plastics. And, and, and quite often they do just as well, if not better than we do throwing traditional muskie baits, you know, from that. And it's just, you know, that's just one example of, maybe how the fish may be different related to the forage as far as how they behave differently at a time of year. But I can also tell you, John, that there is no question everywhere I've traveled, you know, when I started fishing in 
the eastern part of the U.S., you know, getting into Indi Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, you know, there was a lot of these fish don't eat bucktails, you know, and you can't catch them on a figure eight. You know, that was very, very common. And every single one of those places I went to, I caught them on a bucktail and I usually caught them on a figure eight the first day I was there, you know, from there. Likewise, the great thing is though, I learned a lot of the, the trolling techniques that a lot of the Eastern muskie anglers, you know, early on in my career that they had developed. And I brought those over to the, you know, the Midwest and started trying them in some of the lakes that was like casting only. And then, but you were allowed to troll. And it was like, oh my gosh, it was just, it, it I, I mean, you know, early season trolling techniques and some of that stuff, whether it be spinner baits or shad baits on a short line or different, it was, it was just amazing what went on. I, I mean, it, it was, it was really fun to kind of try, bring a new technique from a different region into where you musky fish and have it just, you know, just, you just beat the snot out of them because they're just not used to seeing it. And so a musky is a musky is a musky, but you know, there are times when, some fish want to run things, you know, Minnesota muskies really, really like big baits. You know, they have an affinity, some of the big Minnesota fish for really large lures. You know, a lot of guys are casting, you know, you know, pounder and two pounder soft plastics and 12 and 13 and 14 inch minnow baits and big, you know, so they, there's no, seem to be no limit for those, those big fish in Minnesota. It's kind of a unique thing, but again, in Wisconsin can't really have that same thing happen. So anyhow, I'll quit babbling, but that's kind of a long answer to a short question. You're supposed to babble. That's why you're here, Jim. <laughs> you're free to babble as long as you want on any subject that comes up. Let's go back to those Ohio and Pennsylvania guys trolling. And it was Jake's and grandma's a lot in the old days. And that was, that was regional. That was their thing. And then in the Midwest, uh, Ill, you know, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, you guys are throwing your crankbaits. And that's something that we don't do out here like you guys do there. Like that's a, that was a staple for you growing up and it's still something you catch a lot of fish on, right? Yeah, I, I, I love casting crankbaits. You know, um, heck, I mean, Joe Booker had his career. He designed the depth rater crankbait, which has caught, you know, thousands of muskies and some gigantic muskies all across the muskie range. It was designed for cranking, you know, casting and cranking deep cabbage beds, you know, and, and the idea being that the, the, the bait is pointed downward. It was buoyant, you know, you got the lip there and it would swim down, make, could make contact with a cabbage stalk. And then when you pause, it would back up and then it would be able to swim through or would back up. And then you would, you know, take your rod tip, lower it and snap it and explode the cabbage off the lip of the crankbait using your leader. And then it would continue to swim through. And so with everyone throwing bucktails and top water and minnow baits across shallow cover, whether it be weeds or rocks, that crankbait gets much deeper into the, you know, you know, deeper in the water column, right? It, it hits the deeper fringe weeds. It, it bounces deeper boulders and makes cover collisions with them. It basically gets those fish that have seen everything else, maybe in the top five foot of the water column. And all of a sudden in that six to eight foot or six to nine foot range, you're making some cover collisions and you're getting fish that maybe are a little bit deeper or, you know, maybe as deep as 10 foot down there. Or even if the bait's running eight foot down, a fish sitting in the fringe at 12 feet below the, you know, in the weeds, 12 foot down may come more likely to come up three, four foot for that bait as opposed to six foot with a jerk bait or eight foot with a bucktail. It's just, it's just how it is. And it's certainly kind of come out of fashion because so many people are fishing, you know, medusas and bulldogs and all the soft plastics. But I can tell you that I, I still use it and I still catch big fish every year with it because there are times when the fish are really, you know, post frontal conditions, they get tighter the cover. And the only way to kind of trigger a strike sometimes is to make a cover collision. And get down there and actually, you know, to me, when I fish a crankbait, part of it is I'm going to make some cover collisions in there and the muskie's either going to eat it or get out of the way. And that's kind of how I fish it. And, you know, caught a lot of muskies doing it. You know, it's funny as a, as a guide, I fish with a lot of Americans and Americans from different places and a lot of Canadians. And one of the differences um, between us is Americans are, are much more comfortable fishing in heavy weeds 
Um, they throw their bait into the weeds and rip them out of the weeds. No, no Canadians talk about having collisions with the weeds along, you know, the way that you did three or four times in a in yeah. a paragraph there. You know, we're we're more weed averse, and and I have to admit, when I was first shown throw your uh, throw your Jake way back in up in the weeds and start ripping it through, yeah, it didn't take me long to go. You know, that's just not a good idea for me, and so you know, I miss out on all those fish, but. Same thing with, with jerk baits. Americans are much more willing to throw suics up and just rip the day. I've had Americans say that weed bed wouldn't even be here on my lake bat home because so many musky guys would have ripped baits through it. So yeah. just a, a, you know, a difference that way between Canadians and Americans. Yeah. But John, um, I think John, the one thing is that it's not the visual stuff, you know, I, I mean, I think it's really the you know, you know, any kind of weed line is going to kind of, the weeds are going to taper as you get deeper, right? You're going to have that weed edge. And in some of the clear lakes, you know, maybe the weed line's 15 foot. Some of the stained water lakes, maybe that weed line's 11 foot where it grows. And so you can see the visual weeds in a stained lake that's in the top five, six foot of water. But it's those weeds, those fringe weeds that are in that, let's say nine to 11 or 12 to 15. That's where you can work a crankbait rather than throwing up in the junk throwing and, and working that lure along those deeper edges that there are little points and fingers that come in and out. And that's where the bigger muskies tend to lay or, or be related to that. You know, much the rocks are the same way. And that's where I think a crankbait is a good tool that's often overlooked, you know, and, and, and that's where we catch them. Yeah. I have rediscovered the crankbait um, the last bunch of years um, more so though, um, I, I've, I'm finding baits that I can fish really shallow in and around the weeds and using it more as a fall technique, um, yeah. you know, fish, fishing over the weeds, fishing slower in the same kind of places that I might fish an inline and in, in warmer water. Let's talk about soft plastics and some of the regional differences <laughs> in how people use those. And I'll preface this by saying, you know, when a, when a bulldog, we'll call the bulldog the first soft plastic that came out. Um, it never came with any instructions. They just gave you this giant, ugly piece of rubber and yeah. said, here, go go fish muskies with it. So everybody looked at it in a different way in different places. And so, you know, I've, I've, I kind of categorized Americans into fishing it two or three different, different ways. The guys, um, from the, from the Great Lakes, uh, they want to rip it up and down and drop so that it's dropping. Spencer Berman talked about that last week so that they're ripping it up six and seven feet and letting it fall down and cover cover good depth. Um, the guys from New Jersey, when they first showed up, they have a lot of pressure in New Jersey. They say they know the names of all their muskies when they go around the lake. A lot of the time you need something that's, that's going to be really vulnerable and slow. And so they just throw a dog out and they just swim it really slowly, just like this just a completely different concept, you know, to appeal to their fish. You know, both are right, both work, but what do you think about soft plastics in different places? Yeah, no, it, you know, it, it is so true, John, that there's a difference. In fact, the first time I went and fished muskies in Indiana, it was in May, it was what was called the Indiana Muskie Classic. They have an annual tournament slash fundraiser there, um, fun fishing event. And and I remember, God, it was like, you know, it was probably 25, 30, 30 years ago, let's say then. And so I got there and we're fishing the basin. So we're fishing for suspended muskies in 30 to 50 foot of water because there's shad everywhere swimming around and the muskies are all throughout the water column. And I'm with this one, one friend of mine and he puts on a bulldog, throws it out and just starts straight cranking as fast as he could. He's, ah, just, and th and this, this bait's running a foot below the surface. I can see it and I watch him make a cast and I'm like, what the heck is that? Fires out another one, makes another cast, just bringing it in like a blade, you know, and it's going maybe not quite as fast. It's a foot and a half below the surface this time, you know, I'm watching him, you know, he makes a fourth, third cast. I go, what are you doing? You know what I mean? He goes, you know, what are, what are you talking about? I mean, there's that way fish a bulldog. And I'm like, wow, never seen it like that. Fourth cast, he catches one, you know, and I'm like, are you kidding me? So I put a bulldog on, you know, after he catches one and I start ripping it and he's looking at me like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? You're working way too hard. He catches another one on that bulldog. Of course, after he catches two, the next thing I know, I'm straight cranking it. I'm not, I'm no dummy. 
you know, I'm going to adapt and go from there. But it, you know, and, you know, not that I really do that too often, believe me, by any means. I mean, I'm usually using that rip pull kind of like Spencer Berman does or someone else. I'm, you know, I'm trying to, you know, make that bait lift the two or three foot and then fall and, uh, and, you know, and try that. You know, I know some people, the, uh, you know, a lot of the, a few, a handful of the really successful pro musky tournament trail anglers, they're, you know, I talked about making the cover collisions with the crankbait where you kind of get it down on the weed edge and then you kind of maybe make contact with the cover purposely and then rip it free, you know, and let it float up. Well, they're taking these soft plastics, the Medusas and the Bulldogs, and they're doing the same thing where they're putting the rod tip higher and they're throwing it and they are purposely letting that bait make contact with the weeds and then with their high rod tip exploding it up and really controlling the depth and there are a few anglers that are outstanding at soft plastic depth control you know and being able to as the weed growth gets deeper as you pull your you know your boat moves the lure moves away from the cover being able to run the bait deeper systematically and work it and make contact with the thing and they catch lots of muskies it's not just one pull pause retrieve it's really trying to pay attention to where in the water column that soft plastic is and then make it go deeper but still ripping it and making occasional contact with the weed cover so it's never too far above a muskie's head and so you know there's a lot of different you know techniques mostly it's a rip and pause in the summertime i think it's it's faster and people are using let's say a high speed tranks to keep it higher in the water column or to or to be able to pick up you know line faster or move the bait faster in the water and in the fall it's generally a slower, you know, rip pause or lift drop where the bait's running slightly deeper and maybe use a slower speed gear ratio, maybe like a 400 tranks with a slower speed to kind of get it to run a little deeper. Do you, you mentioned using some, some fast size lures early in the season before. Do you do any soft plastic presentations with Carolina rigs or are you presenting down deeper at all like that? You know, I, I don't do that. What I end up doing, the, the you know, one of my go-to baits is like is a like a um, a three-quarter ounce, you know, jig, you know, hair jig with a with a big five-inch shad tail on it. Sometimes, and I'll actually throw it up against the bank and pop, pop, pop it, and or drag it, and then swim it. Use a combination of drag and swim around the shallow cover and do that early. So that's one of the soft plastics. Or I'll use a really small, some of those smaller. Um, you know, not necessarily like the micro medusas, but the next, the, 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 some of the smaller ones, the, the mid and smaller sizes that are maybe five inches long, six inches long, the soft plastics, this, this again, just downsizing, particularly, you know, in the cold water, it just seems to be more productive than per se throwing your traditional, you know, medusa or bulldog from there. Got a question that Lisa just put up from Dusty James Rhodes. About your favorite go-to bait in the spring, if you're in a relatively shallow body of water. Yeah, you know, again, you know, when we talk about fish in spring, you know, it in what's going to be my first go-to bait. It's kind of going to depend on for me what's the trend of the weather. Has it been warm and stable, or has it been really unstable? If it's been warm and stable, and I'm fishing it, and I'm fishing over shallow cover, you know, I might fish you know, a small inline, like a five, four or five inch inline bucktail um, spinner, or I might fish a five, five inch minnow bait, you know, or even a five inch glider. If conditions are such where they've been up and down and it's a cold front and, and conditions are really cold, you're wearing all your clothes near the opener. That's when I might tend to jig fish more, or my first bait might be a five inch husky jerk, you know, with, you know, a lighter fluorocarbon leader and a bass crankbait that, I mean, crank and rod that, that may be my opening day, you know, assault. Interesting. Um, let me ask you if there's a difference between fishing for tigers and fishing for full on muskie. Is that the same fish? You know, th there is a difference, you know, uh, you know, that, you know, tigers are more aggressive than naturals and, and, uh, as a general rule that I've seen. And they do tend to like the pipe colors. You know, I, I've caught lots of hybrids throughout the years. And, you know, some of them that were, some of them fishing, you know, tiger musky lakes and some of them that were just naturally, you know, occur, you know, on some lakes in Wisconsin or Minnesota, some that were stocked, 
you know, a few of them that were stocked there. And it seems like I catch the pike on the, you know, I catch them on the oranges and the chartreuse colors, you know, the real bright colored stuff. It seems like that's the ones I get. Um, I also, what's really interesting is it sends like on some of the really warm weather months, like in August, you know, really when the water temps get near their peaks, the, the hybrids show up, you know, and, and lots of places and they get caught and don't ask me why, but I've had them show up in lots of lakes throughout the Muskie range where, um, you know, that really peak water temp and, you know, which is not really pike related. You know, you think you hear them going near springs and doing it, but, but they tend to show up more that time of year in the months of August. And, and if you go and you take a look at all throughout a lot of places throughout the musky range, when you, you look at some of the bigger hybrids get caught that are not just pure hybrid lakes where they only stocked hybrids, you know, let's say on the West coast, whatever, where they're mixed, you tend to find them being caught in the really warm water months. So if you want to catch yourself a tiger, you might want to fish in August, you know, and some of those lakes that maybe have some of them. And then, they tend to be in the same spots as muskies, but they tend to like the really the hot, the hot color patterns like, you know, northern pike always seem to like. Okay, interesting. Yeah, we just have the naturally occurring tigers up here. And yeah. so it's a really special fish when, when we come across one. Um, let me ask you about old Jim Sarek versus new Jim Sarek. Yeah. All the, all the learning that you've done. So go back 30 years, 35 years when you started till now and let's talk about what you've picked up from all the places you've been and and you get to fish with a lot of different guides in a lot of different places as well as different water so you're much smarter and we'll assume that you're much smarter at at this stage um does modern day gym uh run and gun more or run and gun less mm. i would say that it, 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 again, that the run and gun, I mean, I still love to run and gun and do that, but it, that, that folks is truly based on weather conditions. You know, what are the current conditions as a, as a, you know, and I let the fish tell me what they want. And, and I, and I, and so I guess as I've gotten, as I more experienced, you know, and I don't want to really want to say older, although I am older, but as I become more experienced at this, John, you know, I, I tend to not take it to the fish and have, I have a game plan, but I, you know, but I try to not let myself have too many, you know, and I have a hypothesis, been a, sci a scientist and a theory, what's going to happen today. But I try not to take it to the fish as much as I did when I was younger, where when I was younger, it was like, this is what they're going to do today. I am going to force feed them to eat this bucktail, you know, and, and, and by definition, I, I would, you know, could get it to happen or not. Right. So now I tend to say, okay, in these conditions, it's warm, it's, it's humid. Maybe it's a little overcast. Yeah, they're probably going to bite blades today, given those conditions. But as I go get on the water, if the fish aren't reacting or maybe they're slow to kind of follow it in, they're not really hot and heavy on it. I'm more, I'm more focused, much more focused on how are the fish following? How are they responding to the lure? And so given their response, if they're following low and slow behind it, I'm more likely to switch baits. Um, if they're behind it, but they're, they're not biting it, you know, maybe I'm going to switch speeds, you know, I'm more on that or maybe switch color or go to something more erratic. So I, I tend now to really read the muskies more in a thing. And if it's a lake that I fish regularly, like anybody else at home, you know, if you have a lake that you fish regularly throughout the season and you've got five or 10 spots, so you know where the muskies live, you know where they're usually at. If you go fish those first three or four spots where the muskies normally are and you're not getting them to respond, you know, you can, you should make the assumption, or at least I would, if it's a lake, I know they're there, they're not biting these lures. I can then go back and refish them with something totally different, right? So if you're fishing a brand new lake, you've never gotten on before and you have no history it's a little bit different situation, right? You're, you don't know for sure why those fish and then you, you need a response. But if it's a lake that you fish a lot, I think it's one where you got to take advantage of your history. And, you know, what I do is I go and I, I definitely am kind of reading the fish more and, and, and I'm definitely aware of all the outside factors, you know, moon and everything else that's going on. And when, when fishing may good, may be good. Yeah, I think we're fishing places where we both believe the fish are and not seeing them 
you know, where it used to be a panic, got to go somewhere else. Now it's okay. We're just not appealing to them the way that they want to be appealed to because they're there. And so you got to address that mood. I tend to, I tend to, to run and gun less, I tend to do everything slower as I, uh, <laughs> as I get more, ex get more experienced in life. I'm yeah. along the same vein. And maybe you answered it already. Do you generally fish faster or slower than you used to? That's, that's in terms of presentations, not in terms of run and gun. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I think that what I've learned is that, you know, you can get fish, particularly in the summer months, to eat a blade, a bucktail, much faster than I ever thought. And part of that is we have better equipment, right? I mean, you think about the Shimano reels we have, you know, they are, the gears themselves are made better and the, and the reel frames are better. So the gears don't flex. And so you can crank harder and faster and bring in baits at a faster speed than, than, than you ever thought. So, and, and you can do it longer without getting as tired, you know, get a good reel rod, like a Skix rod, you point it right at the reel and you can crank faster. So I believe there are times when speed really becomes a big trigger. So there are times when I'm fishing a blade and I, you know, use speed to get them to bite. There's times when it's sunny and it's windy and I'm fishing a rock area and I'm taking a, a nine or a 10 inch minnow bait and I am bouncing the, you know, the bill of the, of the, of the shallow running minnow bait off the rocks, almost trying to bust it off, you know, trying to wake up any muskie in the area to kind of get him to re respond to that bait, let him feel it, know the baits there, hear the sound and maybe react to the flash and the fast moving. So I think in the summer months, I use more speed than ever, but then once again, I'm reading the fish. And if they're not responding to that speed, I'm going to slow down. But on the flip side, I tell people when I'm fishing a lure, let's say it's a bucktail and you're bringing in at whatever speed. And all of a sudden you have a musky engage that, you know, that lure, you see him show up behind that bait. I instantly take my reel and I crank it like three times faster to pull the lure away from the fish. My reaction to get a muskie strike is always get lure away from the fish, make the fish swim faster. Don't do the same thing. Otherwise that muskie will swim up to the boat, go around in the figure eight a couple times, be a chamber of commerce muskie and swim away. The difference between follows and strikes is more often that first couple seconds of engagement, can you change that fish's attitude? Now, John, when you and I fished together, a couple of the big ones, you know, they never, they just showed up and ate, which is the best thing in the world. You know, I'll, Perfect. Take, I'll take that any day of the week, but that doesn't always happen. Yeah. The eat part is the important part, yes. however, however yeah. that happens. And it's funny, you talk about you inherently see a fish behind a bait, you speed up right away. And with so many new people, coming to the musky world in the past couple of years and we, we take a lot of new people out in the boat doesn't matter what you tell them logic says in their brain when they see a fish in behind a bait they they slow down a little bit because then the fish will catch up to it and that's pretty much always the kiss of death that's one of those basic pieces of learning that you just have to go through a couple of times don't slow down don't slow down fish goes away and so yeah right yeah. I, mean, I tell people i go you know Muskies are like my Labrador, you know, <laughs> and that, you know, I got an old Labrador and he sits on the, you know, sits in the living room floor, you know, and I'll go, he'll be laying there watching me. If I grow and I go and I pick up his bone and I hold, hold that bone in front of him, just show it. He lifts his head up and looks at me, right. But still will not move. But if I hold that bone up and I run away out of the living room, then he will get up and chase me. You know, and I think muskies are the same way. They are curious by nature. They're following, but you can change that fish's attitude. And that's one thing I think that I've learned is that there are way more muskies now that I catch on a figure eight that years ago they would follow in and I didn't catch them because I didn't know how to change their attitude. And I didn't know what it takes to catch them on a figure eight now. And I've learned so much more about how many more of these fish you can catch that follow. And I, it's, it's, you can't catch them all, you know, and I've had many days where you get 40 or 50 strikes and only get one or two, you know, and they're super frustrating, but there are mo many, many more days on the water where it's amazing how many you can actually get to bite. Um, 
maybe this is a good time for Lisa to run a video for a moment and we'll come back about and go back on your figure eight comment right after this. As muskie anglers, we all plan, prepare, and are consumed in the pursuit of a trophy muskie. Skik Spiral X and High Power X technologies produce a muskie rod that is super strong, lightweight, and increases casting distance. Helping muskie anglers maintain focus throughout the long days on the water. We designed this rod with the intention to create the most technologically advanced musky rod. Skix is available with two-piece saltwater tested tough technology for easy storage in your boat or truck and are designed to handle any musky lure. At that special moment when a giant muskie appears, you can be assured you're backed by precision Shimano technology. If you fish for skis, you need these. Skicks from Shimano. Now that's a rod that you designed with or for Shimano, right? Yeah, yeah. And I watched that video on that and that fish. That was, you know, that was one of those. It was that was a last minute figure eight moon. That was like that catching that fish. That was like fifty two inch, I think it was in, in Minnesota. That was one of those crazy experiences where it all kind of came together, and you needed I needed every every everything to kind of come together to make it all happen for sure um catching you talk about catching more and more fish at the side of the boat i have the same experience as well and that comes from fishing for smarter and smarter fish fish that have been caught before you know and when you first started showing up on the ottawa river in in 91 the job back then was finding muskies and those muskies hadn't been caught and a lot of them haven't seen lures. But the game today has changed to tricking experienced fish. It's not about finding them anymore. It's tricking them at knowing the right time when they can be tricked, when they're vulnerable, and especially finishing at the side of the boat. And the one thing that I think's caught both of us a lot more fish in the, in the last bunch of years is that our musky rods have gotten longer. So your fish, yeah. I, I'm using a nine foot skix now, which lets me take my rod down six feet under at the side of the boat, take the fish's eyes farther away than it's ever been off of the boat and off of me. And it lets me do big circles. And so, you know, long rods, big circles. And we always say to people that come out on the Ottawa, you're fishing for a big fish and big fish can't turn small circles. So you know, we're really using the big rod to cover water. Same experience for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, you know, you the little Zorro figure eight, you know, the little tiny 12, you're not going to catch them, you know, doing that. And and the long rod allows you to do a couple things on the figure eight. It allows you to make either a big oval or circle, if that you like to do, 
or a big figure eight, which is what I, you know, pattern what I do. It also, it helps you to, if you, if you make a mistake, like if you go to make a turn of the figure eight and all of a sudden a fish shows up with that longer rod and, you know, I'm fishing the nine or that nine, I use that nine and a half footer for all my, you know, extra heavy for all my blade fishing. You know, it, it allows you to kind of with an arm extend with that nine and a half foot rod or nine foot rod, extend into the figure eight a little bit longer and, and, and kind of adjust if you make a mistake because you don't see a fish to the last minute. And it also really allows you to make some micro adjustments with the, with the lure during the figure eight. And I catch a lot of fish um, in, you know, doing, you know, little, uh, what I call the hang move. Or are doing little speed adjustments with the figure eight, and the longer rod really helps me. So, you know, a couple of things I tell people to catch them. And I touched on the one, which is when you first see a muskie to kind of first accelerate to kind of pull the bait away from it at first to see to get them swim faster. But as the as the lure comes near the boat, what I also think is really important is that transition as you come from the cast into the figure eight, and that's really critical. So a lot of anglers bring the lure almost straight towards the boat and then make a 90 degree turn into that figure eight thinking, well, it's going to be a quick change in direction. And that's what I want to do. And, and John, I see John shaking his head. And so what I tell people, I do, I kind of do the opposite. So if let's say you want to make your first turn to the right, and I don't care if you make your turn to the right or to the left, doesn't really matter to me as long as it's big and you make a turn. So if I want to turn my my rod, make my first turn to the right, let's just say, as I'm bringing my lure in, I swing my my Skix rod to the left, kind of the opposite direction of my first turn. And when I do that, it gets that lure swinging to the left, and it and it's moving, and that and it actually initiates my turn. So as the lure is 15, 20 feet from the boat, I start swinging my rod to the left and cr- continue my cranking, and then. I make that move to the right as the lure gets close to the boat. And so you get a much bigger swing from the left to the right as that first fish goes into that first turn. And actually what happens is when a muskie is following that lure, when you when you first swing that rod to the left, you are getting that fish into the turn some 10 to 15 feet away from the boat. He doesn't even know you're taking that fish into the turn, whether it be a circle or a figure eight away from the boat. He's already turning. And he's and because you swung your rod to the left, that fish moves in that direction. And then all of a sudden you swing it to the right and you initiate that first turn of your figure eight. Now that fish is just cruising in that turn or that big circle, what you do. Now, the next thing I do as I make a, fig, a, a figure eight pattern is when I get to ev- either end of the figure eight, I kind of do what I call a hesitation move or a hang move, where I actually take my rod and I just move it forward and just hesitate it for a split second. It's not a thousand one. It's literally a split second where I make one of those skirts and those blades that are hanging behind your head, John, just flare for a split second, right? Where it will just make the blade, the skirt flare. And, and that hesitation, right when you get to the, on either side of your figure eight, that's when the fish is going to grab it. If you've got a minnow bait, it will change the cadence a split second. Or even with the jerk bait, it will just make the tail move or something from there. So I make a point of hanging that bait on either end of my figure eight. And and that I catch lots of fish there on those things. So I tell people, you figure eight every cast. And when you see a fish, practice pulling the bait away from them. Initiate that first turn. Kind of you know move your rod in the opposite direction of your first turn. And then as you make the turn, you know, do that hang move, hang it on either side, that split second hesitation. And if you watch the show, you'll see it. You know, you can hit it in slow motion and watch it and you'll see a lot of the good anglers that fish with me. They all tend to do that in certain thing. And then the last thing is, you know, if I've got a partner in the boat, we're doing a figure eight, we're talking to one another. You know, we're telling each other, hey, the fish is still there. He's still on it. You know, go faster, go slower and you try different stuff. And these longer rods allow you to make lure manipulations. And then when the fish does ha- does bite it with a long rod and you set the hook, you always have a bend in the rod, which is what you need to boat them. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of huge fan of that skicks. And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a little shout out to Lorinda Goodwin. Um Mike and Lisa and I sat down and watched your 
Beasts of the East episode. Um, Beasts of the East episode. This, I guess, it's a week or or two weeks ago, where you featured yeah. three trips here to to Eastern Ontario on on one of your latest musky hunter episodes, and you featured a write in fish from from Lorinda Goodwin. Um, and interest, <laughs> interestingly, that fish um, was Lorinda's first ever fish caught on a figure eight. And it was in it was in my boat, and she she she'd never really caught fish on a figure eight. And she told me that between she and Mark the weekend before, they had twenty four fish up at the side of the boat and didn't catch one. And, and I'm, I'm you know what do you need a you don't need a guide. You got you found twenty four fish, but we worked on finishing technique at the side of the boat um, with the nine foot skicks and on the bigger and bigger circles. And that was the fifth or sixth fish that came in and she'd learned that technique and got, I think, 51 and a half, I think that fish was. So it was interesting to see it on your uh, on your episode tucked in as a, as a tribute fish there yeah, for Eastern yeah. Ontario. Yeah, I mean, it, fishing Eastern Ontario, is it's, it's, it's great. I mean, you got to figure eight because you can still catch them. Although I have to say that, you know, maybe not, you know, on the out of her say that, you know, in some of those Eastern Ontario waters where you have slightly lower populations than you do, let's say in some of the stuff in Northwest Ontario, you know, like a Lake of the Woods has got lots of fish. And so I think as you have high populations and you have pressure, you get more following fish in some of the lakes in Eastern Ontario, you still have giants, but you maybe not have as many. And so, you know, you don't get as many follows. And so people are, tend not to want to figure eight as more, but you can still catch them, you know? I, and so that's where you kind of have to have a, I have a slightly different approach for fishing some of those Eastern Ontario lower population waters than I do kind of some of the stuff in Northwest Ontario that has more fish, you know, so. Okay, um, a bunch of people said, you gotta ask them about new water, fishing new water. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm a big fan of your book, Musky My Way. And I think your first or second chapter in that book, you give a, a, a great long analysis of preparing and all the preparation that you do to go to fish new water. So as somebody who spent a lifetime doing that, why don't you take us through that exercise a little bit? Well, not to kind of get into the research thing, because I, you know, I can, you know, obviously you need to do a lot of research and, I, and I'll touch on that, John, in a minute, you know, but let's talk about, you know, when you're there, right. Or looking at a, a chart or a map or figuring out where are the muskies on it. You know, you can, you can ask, you know, you can do the research and I do that, you know, asking guides, looking at resorts, you know, to, but, but if you take a look at, you know, the chart or the map, you know, what I do is I look at, if you're fishing a river, for an example, I look for bends in the river. I look for areas where smaller rivers come in and enter the big river. And I look for a widening of the river. So all three of those are irregularities on a river system. And I don't care what river system it is, if it's the St. Lawrence or the Ottawa or the Mississippi or a tiny river, you know, could it be the redo, whatever, it all is the same. And all across the US or all across North America, those areas tend to have, you know, widening the river more than likely has a large shallow flat, might be in the middle. You get smaller rivers coming into a bigger river, you're gonna you might have kind of some little minor delta environment with you know, softer bottom and weeds that are going to grow in there. Um, as you have bends in the river, you're going to get shallow sandbars or points and deeper layers in the other end. So that that works. And that's how I go to find spots to kind of pick to fish. When I'm fishing the natural lakes, the larger lakes, what I do is I look for the largest basins, you know, the big giant expanses of open water. And I say, I'm not just going to start fishing those because that's crazy, you know, but what I do is I then look to either side of the big giant open water expanses and does the lake neck down or as on one end of a great big deeper water section, are there shallower areas with lots of islands? Is there a series of islands on one side or the other? Or does somehow the lake have some strange shape to it where it goes from being wide open to being narrower? And so you, you use that kind of what I call a macroscopic view, or you're taking a step back at the whole lake and, and you're saying, hey, you know, what areas have 
more, you know, clusters of islands are adjacent near a bigger open water expanse. They're different. You know, they just look differently. Even on something like Lake of the Woods, if you take all the big charts of Lake of the Woods and you lay them out, and for an example, the Northwest Angle is an extremely popular portion of Lake of the Woods. And if you laid all the charts out and you looked at them together and you looked south, like miles south of of the Northwest Angle, you're gonna see this gigantic 20 to 30 mile open water basin. And then to the north, and then, then as you move north of this you know, open water basin, you see hundreds of islands. And then the islands all you know, tend to kind of dissipate. And then kind of to the east of there, you've got this Kenora section and area east in there that's open, that's much more devoid, devoid of islands. So to me, I'm like, I'm gonna go fish the section with all the islands because all the islands have potential more cover and to do it. And so that's kind of how I start by figuring out what type of spots, you know, when I'm fishing new water and there is a rhyme or reason to it. And then from there, when I'm on the water, then I start kind of saying, you know, do it with a purpose where I, you know, I pre-select on, on paper eight or 10 spots that look good. And I like fishing islands because I can, if it's a smaller island, I can fish around it. If it's a, when I call a medium sized island, it tends to have shallower cover on, you know, and weeds on the southeast end of the island. The northwest end of every island tends to have harder bottom, you know, because it's, it's all glacier deposited where you've got more in prevailing winds, depositing more sediment on the southeast and east end of every island. And then and you get scour on the north northwest corner of every island that tends to be steeper and rocky. So you can kind of figure out summer and fall spots by just thinking about that. And then if you and then as you're fishing them, you're trying to figure out are the fish in weeds, are they in rocks, are they not? If you're fishing a gigantic island that's too big to go around, it's miles and miles long, that's when I pick some of the largest bays and I fish my way from I start on the one point. I fish my way all on the point, the rocky point, all the way into the back of the bay, and I fish my way back out. And I'm looking to see, are the fish on the points? Are they on the rock that transitions to the bay? Or are they in the bay itself? And I let those fish tell me what's going on. And then I try to replicate it. And I use my map to replicate it. So that's kind of how I find my spots that I'm fishing, John, you know, to it. And, you know, I tell people, if you can't figure it out that way and you don't know any of that stuff, just go fish the, the buoys. Go fish all the channel markers, red and green or yellow and black. Just be careful going around them. But every one of them has some type of shallow cover that more than likely has muskies. And I'll tell you what, throughout Ontario, all of them, there's lots of great muskie spots marked by those channel markers. That's all I can tell you, you know, throughout all of Ontario. I had one of my guests say to me a few years ago on the Rito halfway through the day, he said, you're just going from boy to boy. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> they they put the boys there to mark the good fishing spot. So that's you know, right. That's right. It's just just the service that they provide. Does the moon factor into into your decision in planning a musky trip? Yeah, yeah, it it does and it doesn't. Weather to me, I mean, I'm a big moon guy, but I will say that weather trumps moon. Okay, that's always been my philosophy. So uh, so I follow the weather. I mean, the moon. But weather is more important than moon. So like if you could have a full moon, you know, condition, which may be great. But if you get terrible post frontal conditions, moon's not going to help you. Other than it may be more important where your only bite that day might be related to when the moon's going to rise or set. So that's when moon becomes very important on that day. But overall, I'm not going to plan my trip necessarily based on moon if I know that historically, um, there's a, there's a time when musky fishing is good. So John, going back to the discussion a little bit about doing research, you research, I research a body of water and could be like the Ottawa, for example. And it might be that now you guide and you catch them all the time, but that might be historically, there's a few weeks a year in the summer or a couple week time in the fall where I'm going to do my research to figure out when is that best two week summertime when John consistently catches them. Let me go to his Facebook page and look at the date on every muskie for the last three years that John's caught that's over 50 inches. And I'm like, look, there's a two week period of August where John crushes them. And there's a two week period of, you know, from the end, you know, in, in 
maybe a week in September and a week in October where John really crushes them. So those are the three times, that two-week period of time in August, the one-week period in September, and that one week in August, that's when I'm going. Okay. If the moon falls on that time time frame, that's better. But I want to be there then. And that's kind of how I kind of plan my moon trips and how they both kind of go to set. Make sense? But that's kind of how I plan them. Yeah. I remember I offered you when, when we were going to fish together, I offered you full moon or non-full moon dates. And Matt didn't didn't matter because we just take the weather that we get and that that's what was that's what was gonna drive the fish. Um do you use Jim Sarek's Muskie Hunter app out in the boat? I do. I do. So along with that, even though I plan, again, bigger picture, you plan your trip around when the best historic time is. And then if the moon coincides with that, that's better. Right. And, um, you know, so I will try to do it on a full moon or a new moon if, if at all. So now you're there and you're fishing. Right. And so the Muskie Hunter TV app, right? It's, it's not crazy math, though it is crazy math. It, so I've got a, a, you know, a couple guys that approach me that are musky heads, but they're also super bright computer math guys. And so what they did is it, it goes and it, it pulls in the local weather and it also pulls in the moon, moon rise and moon set and full moon, new moon for whatever you're fishing. And it, and it pulls in like 22 factors. So it looks at wind, looks at moon, looks at you know, moonrise, moonset, looks at humidity, looks at barometer, all from your local thing. And then it looks at weather trends, what's happened in the last week, what's happened in the last, what's happening right now, um, along with factors that I threw in about, okay, what are the best conditions in summer versus fall versus spring for a lake, river, or reservoir. And it gives all these factors kind of a weighting number. And then it runs it through this mathematical algorithm to then predict when is the best time on any given day. OK, so as a, a lot of a lot of you on who are watching this and listening to this who are really good musky anglers, you know, a lot of this stuff. We all have it. But if you're a weekend warrior, why worry about it? Why not have something that just kind of throws all that stuff at you in a simple thing saying is fish going to be really good or not so good or bad? And maybe, oh, the peak's going to be at three in the afternoon. Right. It just tells you maybe about it. And and so. Rather than have to worry about that, you can simply download the MH the Muskie Hunter TV app for free and be able to see when the peaks are going to be wherever you're at. Now, when I'm on the water, how do I use it? And so what I do is as I'm fishing, if I have a big fish follow and maybe it's one in the afternoon, if there's going to be a peak at five, let's say, in the evening, I'm going to go back on that fish at 4.45 so I can be there during the peak. And it, more than likely it's the peak could be related to a moon event or a weather change that went on, you know, that's gonna happen. Maybe there's a front coming in and the barometer is gonna be lowering and the, and the humidity is going up, all that stuff's with it. So I use the moon and I use my app a lot. On the really, really tough, tough days, like I said, you, you, you picked to be on your favorite lake on a full moon and you're not seeing any muskies. And you're like, what is going on? It's the full moon of August. I'm not seeing any muskies. They left the lake. What am I going to do? At two o'clock in the afternoon, you're out fishing. And all of a sudden, a 40-incher just slowly follows behind the lure. Deep, slow follow. What that tells me is that one muskie gave away the farm. And he's there, there's probably more than one on that spot. And if you're fishing in the full moon, the moon is going to rise in the evening as the sun is setting at that same time. So then, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure I don't go get off the water before the moon comes up and the sun is setting. And the very last spot I'm going to fish may be the only spot I saw a muskie, which was that 40 incher. I'm going to go back to that spot when the moon is rising and the sun is setting and I'm going to use a different lure, probably a top water or maybe a slow moving blade. Depends what time of year it is, obviously. But more than likely, you know, that I found, I don't catch that 40 incher or 35 incher that shows up. I end up catching one or someone in my boat catches one way bigger, you know, on that same spot on that really, really tough day, right at dark when the moon's coming up and the sun. So I use the moon to kind of plan when I'm going to be, the, be have my best chance at catching them. But during the day, I'm hunting for them. And if any of them let me know where they live on a tough day, they've really showed me where I need to be when 
when it's magic time or when the moon's going to be there and make a difference. Uh, uh, Jim, uh, Gord Pizer last week unsolicited just, and I have had the app out in my boat for, for years. And uh, I look at it every morning when I'm going out in the middle of the day, things aren't going well. Sometimes what would Jimmy do? What would Jimmy do? Quick, get the app out. So, yeah. you know, you need help. It's a, it's a good place to go. And, and it shows you when you, when you want to be there at the target times. Um, let's see if we can find any commonalities with the big fish that you've caught. If people were paying attention last week, Gord Pizer was able to line up some times, time of day and seasons, and even kind of where in the water column fish were sitting. So, if, if you look at uh, most of the big fish that you've caught, is there a time of year that they come? You know, it's tough to say it's a time of year because, you know, part of me is like I'm fishing lots of different, you know, bodies of water in different times of year. But the biggest fish, I would say, for me, it would be, there's a, there's probably... There's three times a year, I would say, when when I think are your best opportunities to catch the biggest fish in the system. They seem to be, um, you know, a few two to three weeks, at, maybe, a, you know, or so after the fish spawn. You know, it can be, you know, a lot of times it's in that, you know, maybe in eastern Ontario, it's in that later June, uh, early July time frame. In northwest Ontario, it might be from that mid-July to, you know, time frame because, you know, the latitude things are a little bit north over there, right? And so the fish are done recuperating, spawning. The whole ecosystem is ramping up. You know, you're kind of approaching that summer peak where it's it's a few weeks after those fish have recovered. From, you know, they're done from spawning. They're recovered and you're getting weed growth. And there's, it seems like you got a lot, of, you got more big ones shallow. It's kind of like the first time, you know, they're, they're, your, your odds of getting more of them in that run really good. And then the other time, you know, you can always catch them throughout, off and on throughout the summer. But the other flip side then becomes in that end of August, early September, there's a week or two window in throughout Ontario or even throughout, you know, the other parts of the Midwest where the water temperatures are dropping now and you're getting, you know, temperatures are going in that 65, you know, 68, 65, and they're coming down. And it seems like the home ranges haven't broken down, but you're getting close for them to want to break down. And now you've got more fish that may have been suspending that tend to tend to spend a little bit more time shallow. You still have fish shallow. You can catch fish on top water. It just becomes a, it's a transition from that, you know, end of summer into fall, but you haven't had the first really bad cold front that's going to come through. That's going to like really start things mixing and rip things up. And then I think the other third part is, the big time is in that later fall when you're you're getting when in some areas that you know the water temps in that it's 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 around 50 or 52 could be in the high 40s you know mid 40s when those in many cases the ciscos might be spawning in some areas you know you're going to have bait stacking up and some stuff and you tend to have concentrate more bigger fish as they're you know, they're, they're kind of the, the summer home ranges broke down. Sometimes they're starting to stage near their, their, their spring spawning areas, but you know, this, the breaking areas outside, the steeper areas outside of those areas, they tend to concentrate more fish. If you can find a wintering area, you can tend to get more muskies coming in later and later in the season. So, you know, my records show those are kind of the three prime times to catch the biggest fish in the system. And, you know, that time may vary depending on where you live throughout the musky range slightly, but it's that kind of the the beginning of true summer, you know, when you start fishing in shorts and flip flops like John and, you know, and a t-shirt. And then it's that, okay, it's that early, that late summer, early fall where you got to put a jacket on and a little bit of color in the trees. You see that it's the beginning of fall, but not really fall. And then it's the really cold stuff near the end okay are your biggest fish on bait or on structure are they suspended on bait or on structure hmm i would say my biggest fish early season uh, you know and like in that early season bite and um 
And then maybe even in that early fall bite, maybe on structure that there may be bait present. I'm looking for it. That's there, but they may be structure cover related, but my fall fish, the later fall fish bait becomes a much more important factor in it, you know? And then, you know, in, in the, that later fall thing where it's, yeah, they may be related to structure, but bait becomes a bigger presence. Now, again, every lake is different, you know, and some lakes don't have, big shallow complex structural elements and then bait becomes a big thing you're fishing lake st Clair, you know structure is less important than bait you know quite often you know in there because you know although the the subtle variances by a couple feet can make a big difference but you know they're all different question from curtis wilson uh he's filmed plenty of episodes in ontario and is a huge advocate of its great fishing, wondering why he hasn't filmed much on the St. Lawrence. Obviously, it's less likely so for TV sake. Is it just not ideal? Plan to do any episodes on a, in a section of the Larry? You know, I have done a few sections on the on the St. Lawrence, a few uh, episodes on the St. Lawrence. Have we always said that I'm on the St. Lawrence? But I have done some episodes on the St. Lawrence and caught <laughs> some really big ones on the St. Lawrence. And you know, and I and I fish the St. Lawrence every year, whether I'm fishing a TV show or not. You know, um, from there. So I, uh, I, you know, I really like it. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's it's a great system. You know, I fished it all the way to the brackish water. And, um, you know, and have caught them in many areas. It, it, uh, like everything else, you know, it, there's times, time periods when it is really, really tough. I think the hardest thing for me when I fished the St. Lawrence is that it, it took time to figure out, you know, where the fish are because so many spots look the same. Sometimes you're fishing the St. Lawrence and you've got, you know, a mile long weed bed, beautiful cabbage bed that's there. And then, or it's next to an island with beautiful cabbage or something on it, and you fish five or six of them, and they all look great, and there's no muskies on them. And then you fish the seventh one, and you catch two muskies from it. And you're like, wait, why? what's the difference between this one and the other ones? And the answer is no difference other than that one's got muskies and the other ones don't. So then you got to keep fishing, and you fish five more, and then you find another one. But when you find those two, they will always use those two, you know, in, in depending on what time of year you're at. Um, and so you need to kind of take time and create history and develop a milk rod of spots and build on them over time. And, you know, I, I think for me, it's it, it became that, you know, spending time fishing those all of a sudden it took a while to find a dozen spots on certain sections of the St. Lawrence that held muskies. And, you know, let's say in the summer months. And then the hard part is in September when those summer home ranges break down and those fish become much more nomadic and they're moving trying to figure out how to intercept them. And, you know, that's when trolling becomes a big key and it becomes a, a bait thing and, and uh, it's hard, but no, I, I love the St. Lawrence. I've caught, I've caught, you know, my heaviest muskie was a 53 pounder that I caught out of the St. Lawrence. So I'm a big fan. You know? um, yeah. Like a lot of fishermen, Jim keeps his cards close to his, chest he'll tell you some things but uh but certainly not everything and i admired for a lot of years when you were coming up to uh to the ottawa you never published pictures or talked about coming here or wrote articles on it um back in the time when you were calling it the last bastion of of pure musky fishing um do you think it still is does it have elements of that left yeah, I mean, I think I think the Ottawa is still. I mean, again, you know, I mean, I certainly you have more people fishing it, you know, than you did, but it's still. I think there's large sections of e of eastern Ontario, the Ottawa, Saint, Le you know, the Larry, you know, um, Nipissing, surrounding waters. I think there's lots of great stuff in eastern Ontario. That's, you know, I, I'm not trying to blow it up here on this Facebook, you know, thing. I don't, you know, or on this call, but I mean, there are, there, you know, there's many, many you know, very good waters that, um, that hold big muskies and, you know, they don't get the attention that let's say Northwestern Ontario does, you know, the Lake of the Woods, the Eagle Lakes, you know, uh, you know, the rainies they, they don't get because they're so much closer for a lot of the American anglers or the bulk of the American anglers. I mean, the bulk of the American muskie anglers live in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, 
right? That those three states probably represent 60% of all U.S. muskie anglers in there. So it's a lot easier for them to just for, drive north than to go to Eastern Ontario. Interesting. Um, I'm going back to a conversation in Milwaukee, I think, in maybe 2006. I said you hadn't come to Canada. You hadn't come and fished the Ottawa for a few years, and you said, yeah, I, I found bigger, dumber muskies close to home. And so <laughs> where where do where do all the bigger, dumber muskies live now that you want to go and fish for? And well, what, talk about what dumb means. Okay. So what is dumb? So, you know, you know, to me, you know, dumb muskies are ones that you don't have to catch them all in a figure eight, right? You know, and, um, you know, for an example, when I fish Lake of the Woods, we do our muskie school in Lake of the Woods. We have, let's say we have 200 muskies caught throughout the week in our Lake of the Woods muskie school. 75%, 75% of them will be caught on a figure eight. If I catch let's say 16 to 18 muskies in my boat for a week, typical, I will only get two to three of them that will bite away from the boat. Okay. And of the 18, I'm going to say half of them. The only reason why I got them to bite is it was some type of figure eight finesse move under pressure, you know, and you just got them be cooked barely. And as soon as they got in the net, they came off. Right. So that and and in the states we've got lots of lakes where that's how you fish and you know and you got to get up at 5 a.m to beat some of the fishing pressure and you got to out you don't have to just outsmart the fish to figure out where they're at you have to then outsmart other anglers or figure out strategize not really sound smart you have to out strategize other anglers on the water for when's your best opportunity to catch fish at certain times so that's those are smart muskies and that's you know, so I, I like to try to like not deal, live in that reality all the time. Right. I do. It's all part of musky fishing. It's real. It's real musky fishing in the States. Right. It's hardcore. You know, that's there's that's just what it is. But for years, I tried to find dumb muskies, ones that didn't have to do that. Ones that hadn't seen tons of lures, ones that, you know, maybe lived on spots that you don't have to finesse fish a jerk bait or fish a slow moving top water or downsize to a minnow bait to catch one that you can catch on a bucktail or a top water, a minnow bait fishing fast using speed. So you can use kind of a run and gun approach, just fishing structural elements. And as you fish through them, one that, you know, a spot, a lake, an area where you can like, okay, uh, it, the fish are either going to bite or they're going to follow, you know, and I'm going to get a musky encounter and I'm going to then learn based on that. So it's not that, oh, they're not there. It's like, I just need to find active ones and that's what I'm looking for. So that's, those are the waters that I love to find. Um, in the States, we've kind of, in the last 20 years, we've gone through, you know, the state of Minnesota, for an example, went through this musky explosion. And back then in the, in the, in the, you know, mid nineties, John, the late nineties, the state of Minnesota, the musky fisheries exploded and you had Millax and Vermilion and, and many, many lakes throughout the Minneapolis area and in Northwest Minnesota that were stocked in the mid to late eight, mid, mid to late eighties and went 10 years with the muskies not being touched. Not many people knew about them and they were there. And then all of a sudden when I started fishing them, I'm like, oh my gosh, these fish are just crazy. They're everywhere. And then I, I fished for them as they became their first generation of 50 inchers. So you had big fish. First time they got to be 50 inches, any population that hadn't seen lots of lures. So very fun. I would recommend it for everybody. You know, if you can find this, like now you fast forward over time, people find out about it. Social media and the internet makes this stuff get boom, noticed. And then hundreds of bodies of water. I mean, I mean, boats on the water beating up these fish. They change, they get educated, they die due to delayed mortality you know, they, they can't keep up with all the stocking at times that goes on there, you know? And so now a lot of these lakes, the Vermilions and the Mille Lacs, now they are fickle trophy waters where you may fish all week for a handful of bites, you know, and if you're lucky and you're trying to catch one. So I, I witnessed these go lakes from going to, initially they had lots of muskies where I would get 
t- literally 20 to 30 strikes a day. And the biggest fish was maybe 42, 44 inches to then catching a bunch of 50 inches to now it's like, Hey, like on that Skix video, that was, it took me two days to get one bite given the conditions on that same lake. And, uh, it was a giant one, but it, everything was right where the moon was rising. The sun was setting and it was, I had a history on a spot and all the moon thing came together. And then I caught that fish on a figure eight by doing a hang move on the third turn in the figure eight in late fall. So. Wow. A perfect, a perfect moment in time, right? Yeah. It's funny how it, it's funny what you, you, what your brain chooses to remember in life, but you can remember every second of that video in your head and, and that fish and yeah, that's what we do as as musky people. Um, must be really exciting to think about going to the lakes in northern Ontario this summer, which didn't get any pressure last year, really, because for the most part, the pressure all comes from Americans traveling up there, and they didn't get to go. So, is that your is that your wish list for this year? Yeah, I was excited about it, and then I did the I did this thing with Gord Pizer for the spring fishing show, and then Gord just you know, killed me when he told me that there were more guys from Ontario musky fishing on Lake of the Woods than ever before. And the spots were all jammed. And I was just like, oh, just pop the balloon for me, Gordon. You're killing me, you know, with that. So I still am. I am just, you know, I mean, I love fishing Ontario and I'm excited to hopefully be able to get up there and, and, and fish again. Cause I, you know, I mean, you know, you have more big fish that are shallow and relate to cover than anywhere else. And, you know, the waters are large. They're, they're all beautiful and in their own right. And, you know, I, I, I really thoroughly enjoy it. You know, it's, you know, trying to always put that puzzle together on the big water, you know, the big water, big fish, big challenges. That's kind of what drives me. Yeah. Um, and the no pressure comment that you made earlier, that's yeah. going to give some people a head shake. And when we were talking to you in that diner in Rockland, Back in 95, I remember one of the guys asked you what he thought of the pressure because we were all, we were seeing other people out fishing muskies. <laughs> this was this was concerning to us back then. And so somebody asked you about all the pressure out there and you looked confused for a moment and then gave exactly the same answer. Pressure, no, 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 that you don't have pressure. And, yeah. And, yeah, it's a it's a it's a different world for sure. Well, yeah, well, you do have some. I mean, I, and I and I was j- saying in jest that you have none because I mean, John, you see it in your waters. But I'll but I'll give an example. So for those of you that let's say you're you're from Ontario, you haven't fished some of the lakes in the states. So like I fish, you know, I live north of Chicago, about forty miles, and there's a lake called the Fox Channel Lakes, which has got muskies. It's stocked with muskies, and uh, and there's like eight or 10 lakes, they're all connected that have muskies. And there's four or five of them that are better. And, and let's say each of the lakes, let's say, let's say, I'm going to say there's five lakes. And I'm going to say, I'm just going to make it simple. There's each lake has five spots. So there's 25 musky spots, 25 legit good. There's more, but let's just say it's 25. So to give some an idea what I mean by fishing pressure. So there's 25 musky spots. And on any given day, seven days a week, there are 15 boats during the week musky fishing and probably 30 to 35 on the weekends fishing. So every one of those 25 spots has a boat on it almost all day, every day during the musky season. So you're not really finding anything new. You may be fishing it better than someone else, but so, you know, and that's an extreme case to give you an idea. But, you know, if you fish throughout Wisconsin or Minnesota, any of the lakes you hear about, um, I would say that the idea of having, you know, pulling up to a boat launch and having five to 10 musky boats on a lake is kind of the norm, you know, and knowing that two or three of your favorite spots are going to get fished eight to 10 times a day, probably the norm. So the question is, how do you then out strategize others. And that's when, you know, the sunrise, the sunset, night fishing, you know, different lures, different casting angles, you know, all these other things come into play and really, 
you know, the, and the electronics become more important for guys and different stuff. So, you know, I'm not trying to scare anybody or freak them out, but that's kind of the perspective that I come from on some of it. So when I go on the wall and I'll go up to Ontario and I got three boats on there, musky fishing, and I've got, Hey, we got 15 spots and there's three boats or 20 spots or two boats. I'm totally fine with that with me. Yeah. We think that's a lot of pressure, but yeah. Yeah. Just have really happy to have what we have here. I have to ask you um, to make a comment. Um, there was a great video going around of you and Gord Pizer unsolicited talking about the club model in Muskies Canada and Muskies Incorporated and how important they've been um, at supporting the musky fishermen and the musky populations over the years. You just have a couple quick words on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that we all have to understand that as as a musky fishing community, you know, we're not huge, right? Our numbers are not anywhere near what the bass the bass anglers are. You know, we're you know, we're we're 10 percent of what the bass anglers are that are out there. But yet we have a very big voice. We tend to be very vocal. We love our fish and, you know, and supporting all the Muskies Canada clubs, supporting the Muskies Inc. clubs. Because we're small and we're vocal, we also tend to help. And all the Muskies Canada clubs, all the Muskies Inc. clubs that I know and involved with, they're all work closely with their natural resources or ministries of resources. And they're like, hey, you need a net? We're going to help you out. You need transmitters? We're going to help you out. We're going to come clean up the boat launch. We're going to do whatever. And what that does is whenever these in the States, when there's stock muskies, when there's extra money, they stock muskies in the club because some of the bass club members are not helping out, but the musky club guys are and women are. And so it tends to help it. And I, I am a firm believer that they're the ones that we propagate the research through the clubs and, and raise money for that and keep it going. And as long as you have that, where you've got, you know, we're working for conservation, we're working to, to keep the fish going, you know, we're going to consistently have good musky fishing. If the clubs go away, I'm a firm believer that a lot of the musky fishing goes away. That's just, just how it ends up being because there's not enough of us to justify in some areas, the amount of money and research that gets put into this fish, but it's because we're all passionate and all the clubs care and we're organized and we got a strong voice that really helps us out. Yeah. We're supporting both those organizations for the future of musky fishing. Um, what do you want to tell us about season 15 of the musky hunter television show? We're going to close out with, uh, with a, a, a clip of your highlights from that season just started a short while ago. What do you want to tell us? You know, I, I think it was, it was, it was the most different season because obviously couldn't go to Canada. Right. And, and I liked on, but it doesn't mean I don't know how to catch them in the States, been doing it all my life, you know, and, uh, but you had to fight the fishing pressure, John, like I said, that was one of the things it was like, all right, I've got a season of doing this, but you know what? I was able to find a couple little tidbits in the States that no one else was doing using my same kind of approach. And I found one water that I, you know, that I may have to fish again this year for a while that has some big ones in it that didn't have a lot of people on and uh, which was good. So it took me a while to work at it and figure some things out. But I think it was more about, you know, really a little bit more of a, of a grind of a season where it was, I had to get up really early a lot. I think that was the hardest part of my whole season, but it was very fulfilling to get back and, and fish some waters I hadn't fished before uh, in the States and know that the muskies are still there and they're doing it and uh, and just use some techniques to kind of go back after them again and, and find something new. So I'm really looking forward to next year, you know, 2021 and hopefully getting back to Canada and doing some other stuff. Well, you've been a, a great ambassador to the muskie world. You've been an ambassador for Ontario tourism and all the great fishing that we have up here. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure learning from you for the past 25 years. And I look forward to learning from you for the next 25 as well. Thanks for all you've done for all of us, Jim. Appreciate it. And if uh, you want to play us out with that highlight reel clip, that's probably a good way to end, Lisa. I got him. Got him. Yes. 
Oh, there's a nice oh, fish. Yeah. That's giant. Giant. Oh, he's still on it. Oh, hey, look at him. He wants it. Oh my god, they're so heavy! Oh! Coming in hot! I got him. Go. Fish, fish, fish! Go. The window is open. Come out of nowhere. Come on, girl. Got him. There we go. Look at that. Oh! <laughs> Tiger! El Tigre! Yeah! Awesome. Awesome, Lucky. This is what you dream about catching.